The late 1990s and early 2000s served as quite the refreshing period for Sonic the Hedgehog. The franchise was born in the early 90s with the intent to end Nintendo's monopoly over the video game industry, and they came out swinging. Sonic crawled quite a bit in the mid-90s, though, as making a proper 3D Sonic game during the Saturn era proved quite difficult for Sonic Team. Which brings us to the Dreamcast age, as Sega brought Sonic back in a loud and proud fashion with the show-stopping Sonic Adventure. More story, more characters, an excellent transition to 3D for the gameplay, excellent graphics for its time, a phenomenal marketing campaign, and you have one of the most iconic Sonic games of all time. However, the Dreamcast was beyond saving, leaving Sonic Adventure 2 as the swan song of the console. Enter the other consoles of the 6th generation, as now that Sega was a third-party publisher, Sonic could just go wherever they felt like putting him, which is how we got Sonic Adventure 2 Battle for the GameCube, which introduced a new generation to the character and his world. The Sonic Advance series on the GBA provided a quality return to 2D form, while the main series continued to expand in 2004's Sonic Heroes, a game I thought was really good. Sonic Heroes was certainly lacking in the polish department, but I've always really liked it in its visuals, its story, its mechanics, and levels. I can always count on Sonic Heroes for a good time, which for me is worth quite a lot. But anyway, it's time to get into the topic of today's video. By the mid-2000s, the landscape of gaming had changed completely. In the 90s, the mascot platformer was so common that you could trip over some stupid one you never heard of before on the street. Sonic made mascot platformers a lot more popular, as every company thought they needed their own icon. Some worked really well, and others not so much. By the mid-2000s, kids who were born in the 80s and 90s who never stopped playing video games well, they were getting older. The NES, in the wake of the video game crash of the early 80s, marketed itself as a toy to get more initial sales. My point is, video games were definitely a kid's thing, even if everyone could enjoy a romp of Super Mario Bros. or Sonic the Hedgehog. Microsoft's Xbox broke the trend of the mascot platformer as they did have their own on that console, but their most popular game and character quickly became the Master Chief from Halo. It was one of those games for the grown-ups, and in the sixth generation, games like that were becoming more mainstream. But that doesn't mean kiddier games hadn't changed as well. Most notably, the PlayStation 2 mascot platformer trio was nothing like what was seen before. Sly Cooper was a thief by trade. He's someone that is explicitly not the hero of the story, but a self-interested anti-hero that happened to do a lot of good, and has a good heart. Ratchet in the original game was a bit of a jerk who wanted to kill Captain Quark more than save the day from Drek, and within that framing, the Ratchet & Clank universe was not like the older platformers where people give you the tools you need for performing tasks and being a hero. In the early Ratchet & Clank games, everything revolved around capital. Everyone is a cynical, self-interested cheapskate as the series made an impression with its raunchy sense of humor. The first Jack and Daxter, from a character perspective, didn't really land with audiences, and that's why the sequel, Jack 2, was made to appease the changing demographics. I didn't mean to spend the opening of this video purely recapping the history of video games, but I think it's important to understand the backstory of this game. Nintendo, during this time, never really compromised the identity of Mario to appease anyone. That series is made to just be the industry standard of great platforming, while also not compromising the identity of its more serious franchises like Metroid. But the aesthetics of the GameCube landed Nintendo its more kiddie reputation that they've never been able to shake ever since. Sega was in a different spot themselves. They don't have a console anymore, and therefore don't have the same impact on the market as they once did. Sonic as a character was made to be cool from a 1990s perspective, so do they keep going with that? Or try and play ball with the changing tastes of the Western gaming market especially? Well, it would never work to turn Sonic into a character like Ratchet or Sly, but what about the other most popular Sonic character, Shadow the Hedgehog? He debuted and left a massive impression during the events of Sonic Adventure 2, sacrificed himself by the end of the game, but was already so popular that he was brought back to life in Sonic Heroes. His character in that game ended up on an open plot thread about whether or not Shadow was the original Ultimate Life form or a fake. So let's take that and make it the focus of the next Sonic game. And that's how we got 2005's Shadow the Hedgehog. This game is quite unique. Sonic games focused on other characters have existed before, but none of them were very good, in my opinion. But Shadow the Hedgehog was the last one to ever exist, and the first one, I'd say, that's a significant entry in the main series. But it's a very different tone from the previous game. Obviously, where Sonic Heroes is the most lighthearted Sonic game to ever exist at that point, but here we have Shadow the Hedgehog attempting to be much darker than the adventure games ever were. But I can expand on my thoughts on this later in the video. As I've gone on record to state numerous times in the past, I've always considered Sonic Advance 3 to be the end of the adventure era and Shadow the Hedgehog the beginning of a much different beast. That being, the Dark Age of Sonic. I don't mean to say every game released in this period of time is of poor quality, and I'd prefer most of them over the newer games, but that doesn't change history. 
Sonic Heroes had been more mixed in reception than the previous main series installments, and some were not fans of Sonic Battle or Sonic Advance 3, but a long-running series like Sonic was allowed to have games that weren't really the greatest of all time, and still be considered a big game release when the new main installment comes out. Shadow the Hedgehog was very different. This was a game that from the offset had a very bizarre premise of taking Shadow and thrusting him through this storyline of moral choice outcomes and having guns and swearing. It seemed like a recipe for disaster, and when the game was released, it was met with the most negative reviews a main series Sonic game had ever seen. If Heroes bottomed out at mediocre, look at these scores. A 1 out of 5, 4 out of 10, a 45%. The takeaway from Shadow the Hedgehog is that the game isn't that good, with elements that impressed 1999 failing to do so in 2005. A story that we will most certainly dive into, lacking controls, frustrating stages, it's a mess. But of course, it's not my experience with this game. I was obviously born in 2000, so I was a little kid when Shadow the Hedgehog came out. As you may know, Sonic Mega Collection Plus and Sonic Advance 3 were my first Sonic games. My first ever taste of 3D Sonic was actually Shadow the Hedgehog, the worst version of it on PlayStation 2, but still, your boy played all 10 playthroughs in the last story and loved it. When you're a kid, frustration in video games is just assumed to be your fault and you keep playing. I just have vivid memories of learning the word damn and hell for the first time through this game, having the hunch that there must have been some cool reward for beating every storyline and being proved right and all that. I enjoyed Shadow the Hedgehog for the same reasons that I enjoyed the previous games, however, this must be said from the offset. This retrospective is not a nostalgically fueled defense of games that have received a lot of heat. I love Sonic Adventure 1, Sonic Adventure 2, and Sonic Heroes, I really do, I'm not gonna deny it. But the nostalgia is not why we're here. It's my perspective of the Sonic series, and while I have stuff I like about Shadow, I really don't think this game is very good, and I think it was the beginning of irreparable damage to the Sonic brand, and we'll explore all the reasons why before the day is done. Like I mentioned in the Heroes review, I also only played one version of this game, the GameCube one on Dolphin for widescreen as to fit with all the rest of my Sonic footage. Shadow the Hedgehog never got a PC port like Heroes and Riders did, so the GameCube and Xbox versions are the game at its most optimal. And the PS2 version is trash like Heroes was. Since we're now pretty decent ways into the video, let's get going. To be honest, I can think of no better way to introduce this video than with the whole YouTuber pretends to be playing the game blind routine. Now having said that, that means that you already know that I already know what this game is like. For Pete's sake, I've fully completed Shadow the Hedgehog four times now. That sounds pretty low for a game I've been playing since I was a little kid, but if you know the structure of Shadow the Hedgehog, you'd know that's a lot of playtime. In addition to the countless amount of times I've gone back to Shadow for stock footage and videos or just for the hell of it. Point is, no need to comment without having finished the video that I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, in this particular instance. Let's just pretend for the next few minutes that I'm a Sonic fan that picked Shadow the Hedgehog up for my GameCube in 2005, not really knowing what it was about, but excited to play the next game after several quality titles already. The game begins in a park as we find Shadow, still incapable of remembering what happened to him before being found by Rouge at the start of Team Dark's playthrough in Sonic Heroes, with the only thing he can remember being the gruesome death of Maria Robotnik, the granddaughter of his creator, Gerald Robotnik, and the cousin of Dr. Eggman. As if on cue, an army of aliens called the Black Arms arrive and wreak havoc upon the streets of Westopolis and the entire world. A projection of the alien leader called Black Doom demands that Shadow delivers him the seven Chaos Emeralds as promised. The line, as promised, clearly means that this dude must have some info on Shadow's past, thus springing the ultimate life form into action. Westopolis is probably one of the most unremarkable opening levels in a Sonic game. It's visually striking, establishing the Black Arms as a threat, seeing as we went from a normal society to complete and total apocalypse in a couple of minutes, but nothing about the level design really stands out here, just a path to the end with enemies in your way that pertain to the game's main gimmick, being good, evil, or neutral. Being good would mean aligning with Sonic to destroy the Black Arms soldiers in the city. Being evil requires you to help Black Doom defeat the soldiers from Gun that return from Sonic Adventure 2 to oppose the Black Arms. And being neutral is as simple as reaching the goal ring. I guess I just find it to be a bad omen right from the start that Westopolis is such a generic opening stage. I mean, you'll probably gain access to Chaos Powers at least once in this stage, you'll learn how to triangle jump, homing attack, shoot the guns, all that opening level stuff. But this level is dry and never leaves you with a sense of adrenaline or excitement. With Sonic 1, Sonic 2, Sonic CD, Sonic 3 and Knuckles, Sonic Adventure 1, Sonic Adventure 2, and Sonic Heroes, I can't say that. But I certainly can with this level. And with the neutral mission done, the game introduces us to the gun base where the commander clearly knows Shadow and thinks he's evil, end scene. We then find out that Black Doom knows something about Professor Gerald, but warps us to Glyphic Canyon, a stage where all my commentary from Westopolis carries over. Level still doesn't really offer much in the way of excitement, you run through it killing enemies, getting sucked in by a tornado, but this amounts to nothing besides putting the controller down for a few seconds. And I continue to ignore Black Doom as he wants you to activate five green things to activate the true power of these temple grounds. With another neutral mission complete, we now have the third Chaos Emerald and land on the ruins of Prison Island from Sonic Adventure 2. This was a cool callback, and another stage where my commentary is the same as before. 
This level takes advantage of this saucer gimmick that C is used throughout the game, but no commentary to add here besides is the part where you usually just hold forward and kill what comes your way. The next level, Sky Troops, is probably my favorite one in the game, and the one they really promoted heavily like Egg Fleet was for Sonic Heroes. But the stage itself clearly looks reminiscent of Glyphic Canyon, which we played like five minutes ago. Reused assets will be an issue with this game, keep that in mind. The game really stops making sense at this point, because I did not do the Black Doom mission of Glyphic Cannon, which was to raise the temple, making an air fleet for the Black Arms, but this stage just works off the assumption that you did, as Dr. Eggman gets involved with the Egg Fleet. Black Doom also says he brought this fleet to Earth 2,000 years ago. Like, what? Now that he's literally here, what was stopping him from raising this fleet and getting the emeralds before? Also, why did he need Shadow to activate the gems that cause the temples to fly anyway? His troops are right next to it. But like I said, by this game standards, I've always enjoyed Sky Troops as a stage. It's got nothing on any previous Sonic stages, but I think it keeps the variety high and has missions that are clear and easy to accomplish. But ignoring that, the neutral mission takes us to Iron Jungle, where Dr. Eggman has amassed an army of sub-PS1 looking Shadow androids that look absolutely horrific. Shadow then wonders if he himself is an android, and instead of just poking himself to see, he, with the help of Omega, must confront Dr. Eggman, who confirms that Shadow is, in fact, an android. Meaning that, yes, Shadow did die at the end of Sonic Adventure 2, and we've been traveling with a fake. Shadow then decides to raid the Lava Shelter, which seems to be the last stage, and teams up with Omega to destroy Eggman's side of the Egg Dealer mech. Yeah, no Egg Viper or Egg Emperor here, it's the frickin' Egg Dealer, one of the stupidest mechs in series history. Shadow has to attack the buttons on the outside because if Eggman hits them, he'll attack you, but if you hit them, he'll attack himself. How did this nonsense get past the blueprint stage? Eggman's nemesis is a speedy hedgehog that has a homing attack. It's like Eggman's trying to lose with this quote, latest and greatest creation. But besides that, we beat the final boss, got the seventh emerald, and now we can get some answers. I am Shadow Android, the ultimate battle life form created by Eggman. You may have created me, Doctor, but I will now lead this empire and androids will rule! This is who I am! Eggman, target acquired. Locked and loaded. Fire! What? Goodbye, Doctor. What the hell? That's it? Okay, so what just happened? Black Doom tells Shadow he knows something. We refuse to help him. Gundy Commander hates Shadow for some reason. Black Doom wants our help again. We ignore him again. He wants our help again. We ignore him again. And again. And with the stage in question, pretending I didn't ignore him before. Then Shadow finds out he's a robot, and then decides he's gonna go full Sigma from Mega Man X, creating a robot-only society, fucking kills Eggman, and then credits? Okay, fake recap mode is over now. You know what that was. A blatant example of Shadow the Hedgehog's abysmal storytelling. That was just one of the many outcomes of this game. Multiple campaigns are not new for 3D Sonic, and I've never addressed it as an issue in any of the previous games. It's now time to talk about the subject. In Sonic Adventure 1, Sonic Adventure 2, Sonic Heroes, and even Sonic 06, which we haven't gotten to yet, I don't really mind the fact that you need to complete all the campaigns to access the last story. In Adventure 1, similar to Sonic 3K before it, one playthrough of Sonic is very meaty. I pretty much enjoy every single stage in Sonic's campaign from Adventure 1, with the slight exception of Casinopolis and Sky Deck. That campaign is most of the game. It's the longest one by far, and it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The other five campaigns were hit or miss in quality, however, they served as a fine bonus to further make the game worth the price of admission, helping that most of them are well above playable. Unlocking Super Sonic Story in SA1 does not feel like a chore or something you need to do to make the game worth a purchase. At the end of the day, Super Sonic Story is just an epilogue for the rest of the campaigns. In Adventure 2, experiencing all sides of the story is crucial, but also understandable, seeing as the same three refined gameplay styles make up the entire game with the final story again serving as a great reward for having finished both sides of the plot, something you probably would have done anyway if you choose to play Adventure 2. In Heroes, it's the same thing as Adventure 1. The last story is just an epilogue to the rest of the game. Playing Team Sonic story provides a great campaign, and whether you want to play the rest or not, you at least experienced all that the game had to offer. This is the main difference with Shadow the Hedgehog. Again, one playthrough of the previous games was plenty in terms of content and replayability. With this game, the neutral path, the one most players will experience first, is complete nonsense. The story just jumps focus almost every stage, the levels weren't that fun, and above all else, we spent like 45 minutes playing all of this, and that's only like 10% of the game. That's shorter than a playthrough of Team Rose's campaign at Sonic Heroes. All we did was run forward in chaos control to the end of the stages. One playthrough of Shadow the Hedgehog is not remotely satisfying enough to justify playing it at all. As I set up, 
The gun commander and Black Doom's ties to Shadow are brought up, but then completely dropped from the game by the end of the neutral pathway. In reality, you need to play the game several times to make different choices in the stages to access different story branches to get different cutscenes and levels and different endings. To get the full picture of Shadow's story, you need to play it through to the end. To do that, you need to play this game 10 times. That's how many different endings there are, and in every stage, you can access the chart of the game's levels, showing which missions will take you to what stages. The neutral stage will bring you forward on the map, the hero mission, where you help Sonic or another established character like Tails, Amy, Knuckles, Espio, Vector, Charmy, Rouge, or Omega, will bring you south on the story chart. The dark mission is almost always in favor of Black Doom, which will bring you north on the story chart. It will occasionally be Dr. Eggman as the Dark Mission in stages like Cryptic Castle or Circus Park, as Eggman is the Dark Mission when a character like Tails or Amy are the Hero Mission, but Eggman will be the Hero Mission of, say, Sky Troops, since Black Doom is the Dark Mission. Before I completely go off the rails on how much crap the morality system is, let's just talk about the story as a whole, because while there are numerous campaigns, none of that actually matters, as you'll see later. The story flops from the offset, but then it fails because it's poorly written in and of itself, and that begins with the characters, or really, the only characters that matter. I think it was a giant missed opportunity to have this game not focus on Team Dark. That playthrough was easily the highlight of Sonic Heroes as far as the story was concerned, but in this game, Omega has nothing to do with the conflict of the plot, instead he's just thrown into Iron Jungle and Lava Shelter trying to fight Eggman. And while I guess that makes sense for his character, it still feels like a massive waste that the three Team Dark members never have a second of screen time together. The only established characters that Shadow ever really stops to talk to will be Sonic, who acts really weird in this game, as Shadow now hates him for whatever reason despite calling him the ultimate life form before and the Chaotix, but only barely because of this one scene here. You know that Eggman fella pretty well, don't ya? Well, we need your help to hack into his computer, and don't ask why, and we don't have any more time to waste! Hmm, well what a coincidence. I'd like to know what the good old doctor's up to as well. Uh <laughs> It is cool to see Shadow going on missions with Knuckles or Tails or Amy, since those are interactions we don't get that often, but that's only looking at this game in hindsight, given the more recent titles. Rouge was reluctant to give Shadow too much info on his past and heroes, given the concern about whether or not Shadow was real or a fake. And things like that would make for much greater storytelling potential than the mess of a plot we're working with. Like the Gun Commander. This guy has got to win the award for one of the dumbest Sonic characters of all time, and it starts with the fact that in the game, he's never, ever given a name. And yes, the comic books do give him a name, which is all fine and good, but like, why is it not in the game? But anyway, I do like his voice though. It's the same as Casey Jones from the 2003 Turtles series, and so this war with the black arms and gun has always got me thinking of this scene from Space Invaders Part 2. No acting like a stupid crowd in an invasion movie, because they always get vaporized. Somebody always gets vaporized. Yo, pal, he's probably gonna be you. It's like you got a sign on your back that says, Vaporize me. I mean, that's not very far off from his military strategy in the game. Take this scene before the last stage of the semi-hero pathway, Cosmic Fall. Shadow warps in. Damn it! What does it all mean? And then the gun commander walks in and is finally going to shut Shadow down by... shooting him with a pistol? What kind of plan is that? And then when Shadow dodges the singular bullet lightning fast, he's completely shocked that this didn't work. He then dumps the biggest plot point of the game in our laps that the truth of Shadow's creation was that Gerald cooperated with Black Doom to bring Shadow to life after the first ultimate life form failed. The commander was a terrified, hideous looking, but terrified child watching this unfold while playing with Maria on the Ark. Since the Ark was now revealed to be raided by Gunn because of Gerald's working with the Black Arms behind Earth's back, he blames Shadow for that raid and wants revenge for Maria's death at the hands of Gunn, which is why he works for Gunn. What? Like I said, this story just makes no sense. The writing in general is just awful. The translation is probably the worst in the 3D series yet. Take this scene, for example. What's up, Shadow? Not you again. Nice to see you too. Looks like those black creatures are headed out to space. We're on our way to the Ark, so I guess that means we're going too. Ark. What Sonic is supposed to say here is that the black arms are headed towards the space colony Ark. So I guess that means we're going too. They are on their way to the Ark, so I guess that means we are going too. But what we get, we're on our way to the Ark. So I guess that means we're going too? Some scenes just make no sense regardless of the translation. Like this one after Death Ruins. More salt in the wound since I did the hero mission here. Having a little trouble with those gun agents, are we? <laughs> What a pitiful bunch. What'd you say? We're not here to exterminate these poor creatures. 
On the contrary. What? What is he talking about? What are you saying? <laughs> All will be revealed tomorrow. Tomorrow? Shadow, you should rest. You need to be ready for tomorrow's ritual. You scum! You're going down! Can anyone explain what just happened? Here's the script, as directly transcribed by the Sonic Wiki. Shadow runs in, laughs about how we have gun agents on the loose, then Black Doom says they're pitiful, and then Shadow is surprised by this, then Black Doom mentions this big event happening tomorrow, which prompts Shadow to say he's scum, and they're going to fight now? Like, what is going on? This game makes no sense! But the problems keep on coming. This game fundamentally misunderstood and ruined the character of Shadow the Hedgehog. It says something from the offset that the concept of this game is to decide between being black-hearted evil or a brave-hearted hero. In Sonic Adventure 2, Shadow was on the villain team, however this was because of the fact that his memories of Maria were manipulated to make him believe that she wanted him to take revenge upon the Earth for her death, when the opposite was true. Shadow is a neutral guy, but he's loyal to a fault. With Maria's final wish being for him to protect the Earth, and that's what he does with his friends, Sonic, Rouge, Omega, and all the rest. If you want to know how to write Shadow, I just told you. He's one of the good guys, but he has a little bit of a cocky Ultimate Life Form attitude in rivaling Sonic. They rival as friends now and not enemies. The current portrayal of Shadow is that he's arrogant to a fault, a complete idiot, a never-ending cynic, and as much of a try-hard loner as you could possibly imagine. All these abysmal versions of Shadow come right back to this game. But first, we need to talk about something. When it comes to Sonic, I think this is a series that gets a lot of scorn for trying different things. I have mentioned it in previous Sonic videos that when a new idea fails, Sega scraps the idea instead of refining the execution, which is how we end up with a series as bland as the one we currently do. But at the same time, Sonic is also a series where the reception is that something is substandard or broken for simply existing in the nebulous space of, quote, too different from what Sonic should be. I mean, of course it's trash. It's Sonic with a sword. It's Sonic the Werehog. It's Shadow with guns and swearing. No, this is not me in a fanboyish tone saying that Sonic is not given a fair shake by everyone on the planet. I'm saying that regardless of execution, a lot of these Dark Age games were doomed from the start. Shadow the Hedgehog was tempted to be darker than previous Sonic games. The immediate comparison is always 2003's Jack 2. This is one of my favorite games, and it was a radical change in tone from the precursor legacy. Now, you could argue that Jack 2 was the second game in the series, and Shadow the Hedgehog came out 14 years after Sonic 1, which is true, but in execution, this doesn't really make much of a difference. To allow for a change in tone to feel more natural, Jack 2 is a completely different setting from the Precursor Legacy, and Shadow the Hedgehog focuses on Shadow himself as opposed to Sonic. I do believe there are some ideas that are just fundamentally bad. Many of the ones in the Dark Age of Sonic really aren't that. It comes down to the execution, and yes, Sonic does not just get heat for radically different ideas. It also gets heat for the execution because let's just say Jack 2 is leagues and bounds better than Shadow the Hedgehog. Jack 2 tried making the transition between games feel as natural as possible with a very inspired story direction. With Shadow the Hedgehog, it really doesn't come off like a game where the people behind it really believed in the vision. It just feels like a blatant attempt to capture a different audience than previous Sonic games. You don't have Sonic, Shadow, Knuckles, and Espio saying damn as often as possible because you thought it would make for a good moment like the final boss of DMC5. It is instead there to feel more extreme and mature like DMC Devil May Cry. It just comes off as so tone deaf and laughable. Where's that damn fourth Chaos Emerald? A Chaos Emerald? You've gotta be kidding me, guys. This is like taking candy from a baby, which is fine by me. Really? Which is fine by me? Get out of my face with that trash. This is the thing. Shadow, the kind-hearted hero that was led astray in SA2, but put back on the right path in the end, becomes remembered for this god-awful betrayal in the Shadow the Hedgehog game. I don't think meta-era Shadow would exist without it, or at the very least, the precedent isn't there. The endings where Shadow turns evil are especially impossible to buy as we can explore later, but fundamentally it's because I don't believe Shadow would ever do the evil things he does to get to the evil endings, and the scenes where he faces off with and defeats Sonic are pure cringe. Ignoring that, the true biggest problem I have with Shadow the Hedgehog's tone is that the game has no backbone. Maybe making a Sonic game where you intend for there to be darker moments isn't a good idea on its face, that can be argued. However, in execution, going to still a point from Sonic Dissected here, this game really isn't that dark. You attack the gun soldiers, but none of them die, they just lay down laughably going, SPARE ME! I usually try to do the hero missions, but whenever I hear a gun troop going, THIS'LL JUST TAKE THREE SECONDS! I always go, agreed, and take them down in one hit. NO! NO! Anyway, Maria's death is never really shown on screen, the game just dips its toenails into the kiddie pool of concepts like Shadow being suicidal in one of the endings, but even then, Vector lightens the mood with this goofy line. HEY! DON'T GO THERE! YET! 
The worst offenders come from the dark side of the story chart. In Air Fleet, your villainous mission is to destroy the president's getaway plane, ending his life to cripple human morale. But when you do that and go to the Gun Fortress stage, meh, the president is fine. In the Ark, you have the goal of taking control of the Eclipse Cannon to blow up the White House, destroying the entire city. But it's okay, the president's fine. Luckily, the entire city was evacuated. Which happens every time a citywide takeover occurs in Shadow the Hedgehog, by the way. That is crappy storytelling 101. If you're going to write an apocalyptic scenario, you have to commit to it. Look, I was trying to get this point across in my Justice League Unlimited Season 2 review last year. I'm not sitting here hoping to see people die en masse in my entertainment, but like I said, if you're going to have a scenario which would result in that and then cop out with every single person evacuated, well, there goes all the tension. Because if the president survives the White House being hit by the Eclipse Cannon and the entire city survives this, then what was the point? Because now, from a narrative perspective, the tension is completely evaporated, leaving what? The game looking completely pathetic for trying to pull off shock value moments without having the balls to see it through. If you don't think your audience can handle that, then don't put it in the story at all. Or just have the heroes stop the apocalyptic scenario, problem solved. Shadow the Hedgehog took advantage of the newly introduced E10 rating from the US's ESRB rating system for video games. You know how Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom was pretty much responsible for the introduction of PG-13 movies? Because some movies ride the line between PG and R. Well, video games had a similar transformation in the 2000s. As established, the market was changing a lot in that time. Ratchet and & Clank and Sly Cooper will serve as a good case study. With the ratings being E for everyone and T for teen and nothing in between those two, the ESRB had to make a judgment call for these games. Sly Cooper and Ratchet and & Clank both look like something kids would enjoy, but Ratchet & Clank has its suggestive themes and focus on explosive weaponry. Kids could play it, but to err on the safe side, the PS2 Ratchet games were all labeled T for teens. Sly Cooper is the story of an orphan whose parents were murdered in front of his eyes as he seeks vengeance upon those who did the act with the second game being a drug allegory disguised as a kid's game. But ultimately, the dark elements of Sly 1 and Sly 2, like, you know, explicit murder, were considered subtle enough for the ratings to be E for everyone. In comes the E10 rating in 2005. Sly 3 is rated E10, which is fair enough because nothing graphic happens in the Sly Cooper games, but a man dies in the first 10 minutes of the game, and a building full of people is destroyed within the first two hours. Kids can play this, but it has serious themes and moments. Later on, when the Ratchet & Clank games that were rated T for teen on the PS2 got repackaged together on the PS3 as the HD collection, they were all rated E10, which is perfectly valid. Shadow the Hedgehog wanted to avoid getting that T for teen rating, and that might alienate too large a percentage of the target audience, but an E10 is just dark enough to be considered more edgy than the previous games. Now this finally brings me into the discussion of how Shadow the Hedgehog plays. Yeah, I know, it's been like 30 minutes and we can now finally get to that. And I'm sorry to say that Shadow the Hedgehog doesn't fare that much better in this category either. As I have said, this game may have been my first 3D Sonic game, but this won't get in the way of me giving each game what I consider a fair assessment. Something Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 nailed to a T was the controls. Turning, acceleration, adapting to different terrain, the controls in those adventure games was the stuff of dreams. Sonic Heroes controlled far worse than the previous two outings, however I think Sonic Heroes from the standpoint of level design and mechanics adapted to those controls. Switching to the flight type characters and the power type characters provided a good counterweight against the more slippery controls of the speed characters. In comes Shadow the Hedgehog with by far the worst controls in the 3D series yet. If you thought the acceleration in Sonic Heroes was bad, Shadow in this game goes from a 0 to a 1000 in a couple of seconds. Moving at high speeds in this game feels like you're almost always playing on ice, as turning and stopping at high speeds will feel like a fight against the programming. Even Sonic staples are screwed up in this game. Well, first, I should mention there is one staple in its best appearance yet. Grinding on rails. In Shadow the Hedgehog, we lose the part of grinding from Sonic Adventure 2 that was tied to your ability to stay balanced while going fast. But that was a finicky mechanic anyway. The main improvement in Shadow is that switching rails is now done with the press of a button, meaning there's no chance of this act possibly sending you to your doom like it could in Adventure 2 and Sonic Heroes. But back to what this game screws up. The light dash has the habit of just not functioning right at certain angles, far more than in Sonic Heroes. The rocket excel is gone, and we have the spin dash back in its worst form. Unlike Sonic Adventure 1 and 2, the spin dash goes back to the 2D games where you need to stop and activate it in order to move. Spin dash jumping sees almost no use, and neither does the spin dash itself outside of these wind turbines in Air Fleet because you need to stop and use it. And the speed gained here is nothing compared to what you'd get by just moving normally. What I like about the Rocket Excel was that it served as a way of gaining speed from a standstill and also a way to pick up more speed while on the move. The spin dash does neither of these things in Shadow the Hedgehog, making it a terrible mechanic. But the worst offender of this game's butchering of classic mechanics is the homing attack. This is something even the critics mention in their reviews. It's something I've come to dub the stray homing attack. You must now be thinking, what the heck is a stray homing attack? 
Well, it's when you're homing attacking enemies near a pit, it is a frequent occurrence that the wide arc of the attack will send you flying into a bottomless pit. Turning a mechanic that was once meant to reduce frustration and turning it into a leading cause of death and ensuring frustration. This game just demonstrates a very clear lack of polish. Most Sonic games are like that, but what I look for in a video game is fun, and Shadow the Hedgehog is a game where the main character just isn't fun to play as. Everything that made the last three games so good for me was botched. But let's look at something this game does get right. When playing a Shadow in a solo game, you obviously want him to have some chaos powers. The game delivers with the two bars on the top of the screen. When being evil, meaning destroying property and fighting the good guys, your evil gauge will build up, and when it's full, Shadow can perform the newly introduced CHAOS BLAST! where Shadow will destroy everything in the near vicinity, and it can do this a couple times a charge. When fighting the bad guys or bringing people back from the brink of death, you could build the hero gauge where Shadow performs CHAOS CONTROL and flies across the map. The game does demonstrate some foresight here, as even if the bar is depleted, Chaos Control will not end until Shadow is underneath safe ground, which can create some funny effects. Chaos Control! What's the matter, Shadow? Can't keep up? While the meter for Chaos Control and Chaos Blast are active, Shadow is invincible and he has infinite ammo, so you even get use out of it if you're doing a mission. Speaking of which, Shadow the Hedgehog introduces gunplay into the series, giving Shadow access to much more realistic weapons than the ones possessed by Ratchet and Jack, but also some cartoonier ones like the ones the Black Arms use, with some funny weapons as well like the Billy Hatcher vacuum gun that's an incredibly useful weapon, and the Omo Chow gun, the tutorial character from Sonic Adventure 2 and Sonic Heroes being turned into a projectile that devastates enemies. It's awesome to use. Shadow does have some minimalistic strafing mechanics, but you'll never really need to use them. I gave the original Ratchet & Clank scorn for its lack of strafing in my ancient review, and it will probably do the same in the inevitable revisit, but I never did this for Jack 2 and Jack 3, and nor do I in this game. As similar to the second and third Jack games, I think Shadow the Hedgehog does a pretty remarkable job when it comes to aiming and accuracy. The game employs an auto-aim system that has near-perfect reliability. I say near because it's going to feel like a crapshoot hitting these balloons on the grind rails of Circus Park, but in regular gameplay, if an enemy is nearby, the bullets will do a great job landing and doing tons of damage. Similar to the power characters from Sonic Heroes, the gunplay in Shadow creates a great need for health bars as to incentivize players to choose something like a Gatling gun over a handgun if you can get your hands on it. Maybe Sonic doesn't need shooter gameplay, but if a fast-paced platformer is to have it, I think this game is a good model to go off of. Which brings me to the conversation surrounding the game's actual content. In Shadow the Hedgehog, must perform various missions in order to alter the outcome of the story. Yeah, no surprise, this is another part of Shadow the Hedgehog that totally sucks. Most of the missions can be described as follows. Help a character do something a certain number of times, whether that be killing 30 or so Black Arms of Westopolis, or 60 in Glyphic Canyon, or collecting 5 secret discs in Prison Island, collecting a certain number of targets like Central City or Mad Matrix, reach the goal ring like in the neutral missions or the objectives in Digital Circuit, destroy a number of objects like the hero mission of Sky Troops and the dark mission of the Ark and Space Gadget. And lastly, you have missions where you have to chase a thing down and destroy it, like the hero missions of Lethal Highway and Iron Jungle and the Dark Mission of Air Fleet. Individual missions can't really get that much commentary because a lot of them just completely blend in one another and bore me. Think of Shadow's missions as a much worse version of Team Chaotix's playthrough in Sonic Heroes. Yes, I said much, much worse. Team Chaotix only had a couple of missions I could even remotely call unpleasant, and even then, they are so much more fun to play than the Shadow ones because of the fact that the level design in this game is totally boring, and usually there are a set number of targets like the worst missions of Team Chaotix. One thing Shadow has that Team Chaotix didn't was the total false positive that is the checkpoint system. In Shadow, you can warp between different checkpoints to, in theory, make the missions more easy to handle, but I call it a false positive because it adds nothing. Think of it like this. When I first did the dark mission of Westopolis, I missed a couple of gun troops, and by the end of the stage, I have no idea where they actually are since Shadow has no map system or radar, so what am I going to do? Go back to the start and take it from there like it would have in Sonic Heroes. This checkpoint warp adds nothing since you'd have to have the level near memorized to utilize it, but at that rate you probably wouldn't need it anyway. Quality of life increases that add little to the game is nothing new to the channel, but in the case of, say, pickpocketing in Sly 3, it's still an increase in the quality of life, I just don't think it deserves points over Sly 2 for it. Here, it adds nothing, and therefore Shadow should not receive any credit for this at all. Now, since I can't really describe most of the missions in depth, I want to mention what I thought were the 10 worst ones in the game. But upon playing the game again, I couldn't even name 10. Most of them are just complete insomnia cures, like the dark mission of Cryptic Castle. So I narrowed it down to the three worst that deserve extra mention. Number three, the hero mission of Lost Impact. You must think that this level deserves a number one slot, but I could never do that. 
Here, the goal was to destroy whatever the number was of artificial chaos experiments. In case you need to recap, this level is a flashback to Shadow's time in the Ark with Maria, and the Artificial Chaos was an experiment that Professor Gerald made to recreate Chaos, the main villain of Sonic Adventure 1. This mission sucks because the Ark levels are a damn maze. If you know what you're doing, you can finish rather quickly, but if you don't and fail to check one side room, you can spend upwards of 20 minutes here farting around like a total buffoon, because again, there's no way of knowing where anything in this game is supposed to be. These two Ark levels have maps on the walls like, say, Death Chamber and Egg Quarters from SA2, but the layouts of those stages were far simpler than what Lost Impact and the Doom have going on with these countless floors and space hallways. It's a terrible mission. If you want to talk about Insomnia Cures, you have number two, Mad Matrix Dark. This is one of the worst moments in any Sonic game I've ever played. Here, your goal is to ride these digital circuit boards and detonate these bombs that Black Doom has placed. Yeah, getting some real Mega Man X7 vibes from that. But again, there's no map to this giant play area, and your view is this for the entire mission. I feel like it would be very difficult to not take at least 10 minutes just doing nothing but pushing up on the analog stick to change your direction when the time comes, in the hope that it will take a correct turn. But this map is the definition of a maze. The A rank is merciful, but that doesn't excuse a horrid mission that puts you to sleep and makes you angry to boot. With the occasionally glitchy camera where you can't see anything at all. But I can only rate one mission as the worst in the game, and that would be number one, the Doom Dark. Somewhere to Lost Impact Hero, Shadow must help Black Doom root out the gun troops on the Ark, and everything unbearable about Lost Impact is here and accounted for, but there's one thing that makes it worse. This mission is glitched! Almost every time you play this stage, this final room of gun troops, one will always be missing. It fails to load consistently, and the only way to fix it is by using the aforementioned checkpoint teleporters, which somehow convinces the game to relent and spawn the enemy in. And then this guy just completely fell through the floor out of nowhere! How is anyone going to know the remedies for these glitches their first run? This level's pure agony for these reasons alone. The game's also super repetitive, too. So many of these missions blend together, the level design is just not fun to play, and the game reuses content all the time. Like how you have to play Westopolis 10 times, the fact that Glyphic Canyon and Sky Troops are basically the same stage. Like how the Black Comet, the Final Haunt, and the Last Way are basically the same stage. Playing this game sometimes is just like force-feeding, it's so boring and bland. Bland to the point of frustration. I don't mind multiple playthroughs in the previous games for the reasons I've said before, but one playthrough of Shadow's just not satisfying, and the game has far more than worn out its welcome by the end. You just can't win here. Which circles us right back to this game's horrific story. I've already mentioned some of the bigger moments, and the fact that the script is really bad and nonsensical, and the fact that the character assassination is rampant. But then, there's the morality system. In the gameplay, doing missions for one side or another doesn't change the enemy AI at all. Like, if you're helping Sonic fight the Black Arms of Westopolis, the gun troops are still going to keep fighting you and you can't fight back for the risk of Sonic scolding you. Which is stupid, but then becomes a major annoyance when the game halts progression behind killing all the enemies in an area, even if that conflicts with whatever side you're aligning with. This is certainly no MGS4 Battlefield stealth, I can tell you that. But then in the story, the multiple outcomes don't make any sense, which defeats the point of having multiple branching storylines. Every stage more or less takes place in its own universe, where only the Lord knows what happened to get you there. Off the top of my head, I can only think of a few examples where the transition between levels is remotely explained, which isn't a big deal, but then we get problems like the one I talked about in Sky Troops, where it's just assumed that you did the dark mission of Glyphic Cannon, even though in the neutral pathway you did not. My favorite, and was by far the most hilarious example of this game's sloppy storytelling, is the path I'm about to go into. So let's say you end up in Stage 4, Mad Matrix, and decide to do the abysmal Black Doom mission instead of helping SBO or get into the goal ring. Well, then Shadow and Espio must face the Egg Breaker, where Shadow demands info on his past. I need to know about my past. Who am I? What am I doing here? <laughs> are you still wondering who you are, Shadow? There's nothing to tell, Shadow! You have no past! What? Don't listen to him. He's just trying to trick you. Okay, so Shadow has no past to remember. Good to know. By the way, gotta love how killing Eggman mechs and Mad Matrix earns you dark points, so Espio tells you not to hurt them as it's a stealth mission, but then in this boss fight, killing Egg Pawns earns you hero points, but Espio still is programmed to discourage this because it's a stealth mission, even though we're fighting the boss that caught us. This game's a mess. Anyway, doing the dark mission of Mad Matrix takes you to Iron Jungle, and I decided to help Omega take down the Egg Balloon, and now we fight the Egg Breaker again. Doctor, please, I need to know. Those androids, the ones that look like me, am I? Yes. What? 
Laughable line reads aside, Shadow is now confirmed to be an android created by Eggman. Doing the previous hero mission takes you to Cosmic Fall, where I decided to do the dark mission when Caesar's helping fighting the egg dealer once more. You were once a great invention from my grandfather's past, but this is my time. Have you forgotten that it was my grandfather who created you? My grandfather created you? So that is three stages in a row where Shadow and Eggman have evidently not had this conversation before and three different answers are given each time. See what I mean? Every stage in this game takes place in its own universe, regardless of how your sorry butt got there. Like how you can get to Lava Shelter in three ways. One, the neutral mission of Iron Jungle. Two, the hero mission of Air Fleet. And three, the dark mission of Space Gadget. The opening cutscene of Lava Shelter will be the same no matter what. What changes is the backdrop, as it will be one of the three levels I just mentioned. Let's watch the scene. <laughs> the pieces are coming together. This ultimate life form they keep referring to is the Black Hedgehog, and he died, and I'm its copy. I must be the android Dr. Eggman created. Then it's clear what needs to be done. Doctor, you're going straight to the place you created me from. Coming from Iron Jungle, this makes sense because Eggman just said Shadow was a robot, but let's say you did the hero or dark missions of Westopolis and then did the neutral missions from there, getting to Space Gadget and or Air Fleet respectively. And then this scene just comes out of nowhere as the story in the last level has now become about Shadow being a robot. This story is just getting worse and worse by the minute. But do you see what I mean? Because of the branching pathways, the game just makes no sense. Which plays into the fact that there are 10 endings. There are 5 stage 6s, but each of the stage 6s have no neutral mission, only a hero mission and a dark mission. To get a different ending, you must replay the entire game, making whatever stage choices you need to make to get to that stage 6, and play the opposite mission from the one you did before. I really don't know why each of the stage 6s needed two endings, it's complete padding. Lava Shelter is a guilty example because whether you help Omega or Eggman in the stage, it makes no difference because both pathways end with Shadow and Omega fighting the Egg Dealer and killing him in the end with minimal dialogue distinction. What was the point then? Cosmic Fall's true ending is obviously the one where Shadow and Vector face Black Doom, so what's the point of another dumb Egg Dealer fight? Gun Fortress is supposed to be Shadow and the Black Arms raiding the human base, and now Shadow's just going to betray Black Doom so he can take over the world himself? No, just leave it Shadow faces Sonic. I'm not sure which ending would be better for Black Comet, but then you have Final Haunt where obviously the setup and ending of the stage is Sonic and Shadow raiding the Black Comet to face Black Doom. How am I supposed to buy that Shadow would help Sonic and friends only to decide to team up with Black Doom at the last second just for the sake of fighting Sonic? It's stupid. But my point is, 10 endings exist where half of them are complete nonsense. Maybe if they had 5 playthroughs of Shadow, the story could be a little more cohesive and maybe the game would not be nearly as long. But if you're curious, my personal pathway goes as follows. Westopolis Hero Mission, Lethal Highway Hero Mission, Circus Park Dark Mission, Sky Troops Hero Mission, Space Gadget Hero Mission, and Final Haunt Hero Mission. Why? Because Shadow is a hero. My mind has a hard time coming up with a single scenario where Shadow helps Black Doom over Sonic, Eggman, and the rest. I help Eggman at Circus Park over Tails because why the hell not, I like Eggman. But seriously though, I can think of no way for the story to end other than this. Black Doom! Your rule ends here, and it ends now! So you're behind all this. Like it or not, the game's over! But with there being 22 stages, that creates a plethora of possible combinations. 326 to be exact, and guess what, each of them were named in the cutscene gallery. My personal playthrough is called The Promise of a Far Off Day. Sounds pretty epic, right? That's Dark Age Sonic Team for you, spending whatever amount of time it took to name 326 playthroughs of Shadow the Hedgehog. When as we've established, the whole moral choice aspect of this game was a fundamental mystery to the character, a plainly horrific idea with abysmal execution. But you know what? Maybe it can work. Let's say Sonic wants Shadow's help, and so does Eggman. Eggman knows the truth about Shadow and might dangle that over him as incentive. What will Shadow do? It's up to you. In the game that we have, maybe it's a little hard to take the moral choice outcome seriously because, oh, I don't know, Shadow has to choose between Sonic and friends and, checks notes, Black Doom. Don't know what Black Doom fans I'm upsetting with this take, but I think this has got to be one of the worst villains in a Sonic game. As mentioned previously, his character doesn't make that much sense as he's been alive for over 2,000 years and has never been able to get the Chaos Emeralds until now. 
He tries to tempt Shadow towards evil, but seeing as Shadow is one of the good guys, his character does not provide a single good reason for why Shadow would want to destroy the world, outside of digging up the malice Shadow had towards Earth in Adventure 2 that was already dealt with. My biggest problem with him is that he's a complete idiot. I know that every single stage takes place in its own universe, but let's pretend that your choices actually do matter. I betray Black Doom over and over and over and over again, yet every single stage keeps asking Shadow for help. If this is supposed to be canon, then he just looks like a dumbass. Especially in weird scenes like this, where he gets mad at Shadow for doing the neutral mission of Westopolis, but not the hero mission, and talks to Shadow and Sonic like they're both on his side, right after clearing the city of all his forces. We found the third Chaos Emerald in this city. Our mission here is done. Now get going. Guess that means... Welcome to the next level! Let's go! Get back here. So yeah, he is a complete idiot, a complete non-threat, as even when his schemes work, they still fail since entire cities get evacuated. He's two-dimensionally evil to the point of it being comedic. This game is just so embarrassing. I mean, this review has already gone off for an eternity, but we're still not done here. Above all else, Shadow the Hedgehog has to deal with the fact that the main villain's name is Black Doom, leaving the Black Arms, which everyone else in the cast refers to as the Black Aliens or the Black Creatures that are invading Earth from their home base called the Black Comet, leading to a critical response that looks a little bit like this. What's worse is this game could be construed as racist. The Black Aliens. Black Aliens are committed by the Black Aliens. Black, black, black aliens. Eliminate the black aliens. Kill them all. But we must stand united to defend our world against these invaders. That president seems a little too concerned with the real estate value of his planet now that the black aliens have moved in. I bet if it were white aliens, everyone would be all hugs, smiles, and welcome baskets. I don't think Takashi Azuka and the people at Sonic Team are racist. That would be dumb of me to say, because in context, the black arms are an evil alien race from deep space. Actually, I was always bugged by the fact that they're called the Black Arms, but they aren't even black. They're like this gray color. But like I have said, this game is just so embarrassing. The fact that you can clip this game to a montage of the characters going on and on about the black aliens just makes my skin crawl. I have personal experience with this, by the way. I was in a Discord call back in high school, and somebody posted this clip in the chat. Disgusting black creatures. Get out of my sight. And my friend Nick was like, what the, who dubbed this? And me, as the Resident Sonic fan, had to say, yeah, that's not a dub. That's just in the game. It's so stupid. In addition to all the other embarrassingly bad story decisions, terrible gameplay, and other poor execution. Thankfully, though, the game is almost over with. So how's the voice acting? Well, for the first time in a game, the Sonic characters are not voiced by the ones we've had since Sonic Adventure. Instead, the voice cast from the Sonic X cartoon have now taken over the duties as the Sonic cast of the games. I think the voice acting in the Shadow of the Hedgehog is fine, but as of right now, I've decided that I'll go into the 4Kids era voice cast more during the Sonic 06 video, because this video is really ballooning in length. But I'll just say this. I like this cast a lot. Helps that they did arcs of Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 on Sonic X, so there's some backstory for these actors. The acting in Shadow is fine, like I think it's pretty good, but my favorite thing about it is that at times it can be so overacted to the point of hilarity. And that's why I needed the professor to help me. What? That's insane! Combined with these stupid desk slam sound effects whenever characters move their arms in cutscenes. As for the presentation, I have positive and negative things to say. The positives start with the promotional material of Shadow. By that I mean look at these 3D renders of the characters. Never before has the Sonic cast looked so detailed as you can see the individual strands on the gloves and reflective details in the eyes. It might not look like much now, but compare these renders of the cast to the ones from Sonic Heroes, which was only one game ago, and you'll see the massive boost in quality. In the game itself, this translates to some of the best CG cutscenes the series has seen with more fur and shading details than ever before. In the thumbnail, you'll notice it's a Yuji Uakawa styled shadow with the gun. That I once again got from Tyler McGrath, the Twitter artist I mentioned in the Sonic Adventure 1 review. This dude is seriously talented, check him out. But as for the in-game graphics, this doesn't fare well either. Shadow of the Hedgehog is the first Sonic game in the 3D series to reuse the aesthetic of the previous games. As we run around destroyed cities with the plastic characters from Sonic Heroes to interact with the human characters from Adventure 2, the mix of these assets combined with new assets look completely drab and muddy like the Black Comet and the Ark, and the result is a game I don't really find that appealing as far as aesthetics are concerned. But on a positive note, we have the soundtrack. A shocker, I know. This game gets flack for its soundtrack not really leaving an impression, but I can't say I agree. The bangers in the Shadow soundtrack are right up my alley. 
The June Sonoy guitars are firing on all cylinders in this soundtrack. If intense guitar rips aren't your cup of tea, that's fine, but it definitely is mine. I can't narrow down favorites, let's just cut to the showcase. How about the vocal album, you ask? Like the previous games, we have several new vocal themes to listen to, including a cool remix of EGGMAN from Adventure 2, dubbed the Doc Robitnik's Mix. But as far as the new themes are concerned, some of the lyrics contain the same cringeworthy elements that the cutscenes do. Like the lyrics from Almost Dead that go, Heaven can't save us, hell is a joke. Or from The Chosen One, Sometimes I wish I was never born at all. Over the top antics like that are rampant throughout the soundtrack. The Waking Up from Julian K and The Chosen One from A2 are beats I could listen to at the drop of a hat. But All Hail Shadow from Magna Phi is a total banger. The fast paced beat and the lyrics are amazing and get a listen to this guitar solo. Now then dear viewer, I know what you're thinking. How's the post game of Shadow the Hedgehog? Well that's also not very good. Like Sonic Adventure 2 and Heroes, you get ranked at the end of every stage, and unlike the satisfying ranks from those games that encourage a higher level of play, the A ranks of Shadow the Hedgehog will, surprise surprise, put you to sleep. As someone who's A ranked this game twice, once last year, another time for this video, I was not impressed because the rankings in this game are some of the easiest in the series. There don't exist alternate routes in this game, nor are there these trick rings and jumps. Getting an A in Shadow is as simple as this. Complete the mission you set out to complete with a basic amount of competence, and that's about it. Sometimes I have died right before the end of the stage and gotten an A. Sometimes I'll have a bigger hero score than dark score, or vice versa when doing the hero or dark missions and get an A. The only time it really sucks is in Lost Impact on the Doom, where the game suddenly drops the previous standards and your ass has to do a speedrun of the two worst stages in the game to get that A rank. I'll give the game this, though. At this point, I've played through its campaign 10 miserable times, and then there are 71 A ranks to get. If you spent 50 bucks on Shadow the Hedgehog in 2005, the game still has quite a lot of content on the disc that the previous 3D games did. You can also collect five keys in every stage for hidden collectibles and use weapons unlocked by beating certain campaigns like the Shadow Rifle you get from completing the whole game. And this annihilates the chase levels like it's nobody's business. For getting every single A rank in the game, you unlock Expert Mode, which is supposed to be a mode where, like Super Hard Mode in Sonic Heroes, you play through every single stage in the game at an increased difficulty. I say supposed to be because Expert Mode from a level design perspective is just as bland as it was before, with the clear-cut exception of Cosmic Fall, where this part at the end becomes the video game equivalent of Kryptonite. Let's show the montage or sheer frustration you get from waiting on blocks and dealing with this game's horrific camera. Not here. Damn, not here. Damn, not here. 
Not here. Damn. 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 Not, not, not here. here. Waiting on these blocks is something that this game is really fond of, and I can't stomach it each and every time. Something that's noteworthy about expert mode is that each stage comes with dialogue between Shadow and the cast of characters. Canonicity is to be thrown into question given how Black Doom, Maria, and Gerald talk to Shadow. However, I do think most of these interactions between Shadow, the President, and the Gun Commander are canon to some extent for reasons we can save for the 06 review. Not really important today. But at long last, we have finally reached the last story, unlocked by completing all 10 playthroughs of the main game. Ironic given the fact that the last story makes the main game completely worthless. It just opens with Shadow and the Black Comet with all seven emeralds. He didn't fight Sonic or Black Doom, so the only path I could think to get here would be helping Knuckles and defeating the Egg Dealer on the Black Comet. Yeah, the only things that are canon from this entire long-ass Shadow game would be the opening cutscene and the last story. How Shadow gets to this point is a mystery. This is a much different last story from the previous ones where they were epilogues to each game's main story. Shadow the Hedgehog doesn't have a main story, it's a series of disconnected events and what-if scenarios, and the satisfying story, one in the last ten hours, this does not make. Let's get into the plot itself. Black Doom reveals himself to be a villain, no shit, but it turns out that his real plan is to warp the Black Comet down to Earth using Chaos Control with the Severed Emeralds, and then the Black Arms can use all life on Earth as fuel for themselves. Black Doom considers this to be some kind of mercy given how much evil has been done by the people who live on Earth. Black Doom then also reveals that Shadow was partly created by him as Professor Gerald needed his blood to complete the Ultimate Life Form project. All seems lost now as the heroes are immobilized by a toxic gas in the air, but Shadow stands up. That's why you were created. Please help me, Shadow. What? I am Shadow the Hedgehog. I've left the past behind me. No one can tell me what to do now. I will destroy you, Black Doom! Shadow is now declaring that his past is worthless to him as he got the emeralds and learned the truth. He made a promise to Maria to protect the Earth from all that may harm it, and what more does he need to know? He chases Black Doom throughout the final stage, the last way, which is the same stage as the Black Comet in the final haunt, like I said before. The gimmick of this version being that you can only progress by building up your Chaos Control Bar and using it to move forward. As for the story, in come the Chaotix. They've been up to some kind of mystery assignment the whole game, with top secret disks, Eggman's computer data, and the computer room of the Space Colony Arc, which ends with them in the research facility during the last story. We have no idea who hired them for this job, but evidently somebody did, as what they do is project a recording of Gerald from before Maria died all over the world. It turns out that Gerald did not betray human beings by working with Black Doom. He made the deal with Black Doom so he could complete Shadow, but he set up a way for Shadow in the future to stop Black Doom and the Black Comet, and that would be the Eclipse Cannon. This answers the questions that you probably didn't ask. If Gerald was a good guy before Maria died, then why did the Ark have a weapon of mass destruction on board, and this is why, to defeat the Black Arms, and I guess when Gerald went insane and created the SA-2 plan, he just figured that when Earth got destroyed, I guess we wouldn't have to worry about Black Doom anymore anyway. I can give my thoughts on that in a minute, though. Shadow gets a second win from this news, and uses the Chaos Emeralds to transform into Super Shadow to defeat Black Doom once and for all, as I Am All of Me kicks in as this transformation theme is going, and then... It's now final boss time as Super Shadow faces off against the transformed Devil Doom. As we get the usual support from the other characters. Shadow, can you hear me? We've managed to escape from that comet! There's no need to hold back! Cause as much havoc as you need to! Come on, don't give up! Shadow, squash him! You're strong enough. I know you are. It's up to you, Shadow! You can do it! The more the boss fight goes on, the more hopeless the situation becomes, as at the 9 minute mark, something most players will probably never see in their lives, Dr. Eggman comes over the communication with one final revelation. Shadow, can you hear me? This might be the last chance I have to speak to you, so what I said about having created you, it was all a lie. Everyone thought you died during that horrible incident, but I rescued you with one of my robots. You lost your memory, that's all. You really are the ultimate life form my grandfather created. That is right. The shadow we're playing as is the real shadow from Adventure 2, meaning the android story was all a lie. I don't know why in a last story meant to answer all the questions they'd hide this behind a 9 minute wait, but it's good to know regardless, I guess. Mechanically, this isn't a very good final boss, I'm sorry to say. 
I found all the previous ones very easy to get to grips with and understand, but Devil Doom just hurls attacks all over the screen you need to use Chaos Spear to attack his eyes. Hit his two eyes like twice and he'll teleport away. The rocks and debris in the way will make hitting him more frustrating as the auto lock can get confused in this instance. But still, I do think it's a pretty epic way to end the game, all things considered, even if it's too little too late to save the game. What has a lot to do with that feeling, I'm sure, would be I Am All of Me, the main theme of the game from Crush 40 blasting in the background. This song perfectly captures the higher intensity this game was going for perfectly, and it's just such a damn catchy song. I am the supreme being that rules this universe. I am the immortal life form. I am the ultimate power. This is the end of you and the end to my cursed past. With all that said, Shadow permanently puts the past behind him by warping the comet off the Earth and using the Eclipse Cannon to destroy it for good, ending the Black Arm's occupation of Earth. Yeah, he did it! The Black Comet is destroyed! Shadow, that was sweet! I hope he's okay. I'm sure he's fine, Rouge. After all, he is Shadow. Now we get to the gun troops ending, and that begs the question, what is a retcon? <sighs> After the way we all treated him, he saved us all in the end. We were all wrong about the Professor. Let us pay homage to Professor Gerald. Let's work to ensure peace and prosperity for a brighter future. What do you say, Commander? Excellent idea, Mr. President. A retcon is often used as a derogatory term for stories. The full saying is retroactive continuity. In my opinion, that saying does not imply poor quality inherently. A retcon is merely when a subsequent story in a series adds lore to the plot that wasn't there before. This was a big theme of my content in 2019. The later Metal Gear Solid games are full of retcons, as the Cadmus storyline of Justice League Unlimited Season 2 in the DCAU was also that. If you ask me, a retcon can be a good thing, as the DCAU really being an overarching story about the line between government and superheroes was definitely not there from the beginning, but I just think it makes everything better. Here, the idea that Gerald Robotnik was a hero until Maria died is a retcon. The Eclipse Cannon being used to destroy the Black Arms is totally a retcon. Now is it a good one or a bad one? Well, I'd say it's complicated. Nothing in SA2 says what we're told in Shadow is untrue, so by the standards of adding extra lore, I think it's fine, and explains the existence of the Eclipse Cannon pretty reasonably well. I think the main issue is the idea that Gerald's legacy is now that of a hero and not a mad scientist. That's the misstep of the writing. People can be multiple things at once. So Gerald being someone who tried to save us all from the Black Arms can be true, while it also being true that he went insane and tried to kill everybody on Earth. Both can be correct at the same time, but the writing treats it like it's one or the other, and now the former is his legacy in this series. But overall, I'm just going to say that I'm fine with it for the reasons I've brought up. When looking at this game's story, that's certainly not at the top of my list when it comes to the issues. Bringing us to the final scene. Goodbye forever. Shadow the Hedgehog. Shadow has promised Maria to save the world, and that's that. But he no longer needs to be burdened by the past. And that's how the story goes out, setting up Shadow's character for greater things in the future. Thus ending Shadow the Hedgehog on the Crush 40 song, Never Turn Back, which begins with the piano solo cover of I Am All Of Me. Never Turn Back itself being one of my favorite Crush 40 songs. Similar to Sonic's theme from Adventure 1, it doesn't matter. Never Turn Back is a great track, a great listen, but the lyrics about moving on from the past really speak to me, thus explaining why it's my favorite Crush 40 song. Take one step 
And that was Shadow the Hedgehog. If you told me when I first started scripting the video that we would be here with an episode as long as this, I'd probably be shocked. But I feel like everything I said here was warranted and interesting. Having said that, I don't know what could possibly be said about Shadow in addition to what I've already been saying in this massive video. So I'll just say this. I hope it's now clear as someone who thinks the true worst parts of the Sonic franchise of the recent years, why I still consider the Dark Age of Sonic to start here. Shadow the Hedgehog was an embarrassing release for Sonic at this point in its history. It's easy to look at a game like Shadow and think that Sonic's best days are behind it, as this is the game where Shadow goes around shooting an AR-15 cursing up a storm. How could you not think that maybe Sonic has jumped the shark by that point? I gave Shadow such an in-depth look because I've always appreciated the ways in which Sonic Team tried different things with Sonic and were attempting to be the most epic game on the block each and every time, but with the Dark Age games would just go horribly wrong in some way or another. Shadow the Hedgehog is not a good game. I think the story is a complete disaster. The game plays far worse than any of its 3D Sonic brethren. It was built on a foundation of plainly bad ideas. And for those reasons, I can never say Shadow the Hedgehog is a good game like I could SA1, SA2, or Sonic Heroes. I said it at the beginning and I'll say it again. This retrospective's goal is not to give a nostalgically fueled defense of the Sonic franchise's outings in the 2000s. It's to tell you how I feel about the Sonic games through the lens of someone that grew up in the era that I did. Shadow the Hedgehog unfortunately just didn't pan out and got the reception it deserved and was the game that began Sonic's status as a joke. The biggest shame here is that Shadow is yet another example of Sonic Team scrapping things because of poor critical response, which correlates to the fact that Sonic gets scorned for the ideas newer games bring to the table just about as much as the execution. Knuckles and Shadow aren't the reasons why Knuckles is chaotic and Shadow the Hedgehog aren't good games. Sonic having a party game and an RPG are not the reasons Sonic Shuffle and Sonic Chronicles didn't work. What they should be doing is taking a look back at the game itself and seeing what went wrong and trying to improve. But the right lessons are hardly ever learned from an unsuccessful Sonic game, which is something that's been a plague for the series for over 20 years now. And that begs the question, if you keep rushing games to market before it's ready, and then scrap ideas because the critics don't like said rushed game, when you could instead improve upon the ideas, if that cycle continues again and again and again and again, what are you left with after all is said and done? 